advanced society in an ancient world now stands charged with cannibalism. One man is obsessed with digging up the truth. We have the cutting, we have the burning, we have the missing vertebrae. Has he found it? And do we dare listen? But first, a stormy day, a terrible explosion. Spoken in flames now, and the flame is rising to the ground, not twice in the morning, man. The tragedy becomes a legend, and the end of an era. It's a terrific race, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody knows what doomed the Hindenburg. But what if everybody's wrong? All the humanity and all the things. Uncover the secrets of the dead. of the Dead was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. For a full decade early last century, one form of transportation was considered the fastest, most technologically advanced, and most luxurious of its day. We're greeting you now from the Naval Air Base at Lake Hurst, New Jersey, from which point we're going to bring you a description of the landing of the mammoth airship Hindenburg. It's rushing to the flames. Get it started. Get it started. It's right and it's right. It's right. It's terrible. It's all the folks agree that this is terrible. This is one of the worst catastrophes in the world. They always see the money. All the humanity and all the fans of this baby garage. I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. In just 34 seconds, the golden age of airship travel was ended by the fireball that engulfed the Hindenburg, killing 35 passengers and crew. The hydrogen that gave the ship its lift has always been blamed for the tragedy, but a startling new theory has emerged. Former NASA hydrogen specialist Addison Bain has been investigating the cause of the disaster using modern techniques that were not available during the initial inquiry. After nine years, he is confident he has the hard evidence to prove his theory. Well, the prevailing theory for 60 years was first that free hydrogen got loose and mixed with the air, then there was a source of ignition, and that's the theory that's persisted. But I think that uh, it's much more than that, much more deeper than that, and I do believe that uh, they knew that within a couple of months after the accident. The largest aircraft ever built the LZ-129 Hindenburg was the pride of Nazi Germany. Nearly 820 feet long, she was just 82 feet shorter than the Titanic. She was the world's first intercontinental passenger airliner, the most sophisticated airship built by the Zeppelin company. The Hindenburg was the epitome of German technology at that time. It was an airship really designed to carry passengers with a certain amount of luxury and comfort it was the Concorde of the period, if you will. That is, why do people spend money on, you know, flying the Concorde? It's to get somewhere fast. That's what the Hindenburg was all about. It was the fastest means of sending passengers and mail uh, to the United States or to South America. In New York City, there were even plans to dock airships to the top of the Empire State Building. Plank hundreds of feet up in the air combined with unpredictable high winds made the idea impractical. But some primitive fly-by-mail pickups were attempted. With the jet age still some years away, airship travel was unique in its ability to combine speed and comfort. You take off in an airship, you're just sitting there and standing looking out the windows and the ground just drops away from you. Completely opposed to an airplane where you're going down a runway with seat belts on and grip on your seat. In an airship, you're completely relaxed. The passengers going to Europe, a lot of times they'd uh, go down to their cabin to get freshened up, and they'd ask the cabin steward uh, what time the, air the airship was going to take off. They'd say, well, we're over in New York. We took off 20 minutes ago. The type of people who would fly 
uh, on the Hindenburg were probably very much the same type of people who would uh, take a ride on the Titanic. It was the wealthy of the world to do. The flight cost approximately, I think it was 1,400 rice mark, which was the, about the price of, of a Volkswagen and a half. So that gives you a price comparison in today's terms, if you will. We were completely overwhelmed by the ship. We hadn't realized that we would be boarding a flying hotel. We were very conscious that this was a unique and a magnificent experience that might never come again. The Hindenburg could carry up to 72 passengers on her luxurious living decks. Flying at speeds of up to 84 miles an hour, she could complete the trip from Germany to America in two and a half days, twice as fast as by boat. when I saw the Hindenburg, I remember just like it was yesterday. And she's flying about a 300, 400 foot altitude. And traffic was stopped for a stoplight and I had my convertible, I had my top down. And the stoplight went red three or four times and nobody moved. They jumped out of their cars, they're staring at this. You can see the passengers waving and the crewmen. You see a big thing like that, you think it's hardly believable it could be flying. But it's floating in the air just like a cloud. Majestic and beautiful. The Hindenburg was gorgeous. It was a beautiful ship, sleek and everything, and the people and everything in it was so just beautiful. Of course, it was Hitler's ship, and it was outstanding. If you want to travel in a beautiful, elegant, and thoroughly pleasurable way, your first choice has to be a Zeppelin. When it comes to elegance, the most luxurious cruise liner is no match for the Zeppelin. Other airship companies were less successful. In 1925, the British R-33 was ripped from her moorings by gale force winds. And four years earlier, the R-38 broke apart during a test flight, killing 44. Accidents like these had already marked the beginning of the end for the British and American airship initiatives. During one notorious incident in 1932, two members of the ground crew fell to their deaths when the USS Akron broke free during a landing. The Germans were far more advanced than the British or the Americans in the uh, sense of airship technology. The British, unfortunately, had a somewhat of a haphazard uh, arrangement of simply copying captured German airships uh, during the First World War, so that they really didn't have that uh, tradition um, and that, that fundamental technology that you needed uh, to build airships. The Hindenburg's value as a propaganda tool was quickly recognized by the Nazis. But Hugo Eckner, the head of the Zeppelin company, was well known for his hostility towards the Third Reich. Eckner was very open and blunt about his distaste for the Nazi party. In fact, it's probably a wonder that he survived the Second World War. A good example being it was anticipated by the Nazi party that the Hindenburg would be called the Adolf Hitler. Um, and Eckner did not like the idea very much and had, of course, then the lettering Hindenburg put on very quickly to uh, eliminate any, any temptation, if you will. But despite his efforts, Eckner was powerless to prevent the Nazis from using his ship. Hitler remorselessly exploited the Hindenburg's image, commandeering her for leaflet dropping during his political campaign. The Nazi party ordered that the swastika be put on the tails of the airships. And with that, then, the, um, how should we say, the party leaders used then the airship as a propaganda tool. And you have this airship flying overhead and Hitler standing there in, with his chest out, you know, this is Nazi Germany. The Nazis' confidence in the Hindenburg was more than justified. By the 1930s, the Zeppelin company had accumulated a huge reservoir of expertise in building and flying airships. What distinguished the Hindenburg was the sophistication of her construction. Like all Zeppelins, she was a rigid airship, built from an intricate, lightweight aluminum inner cage. A cage that contained both the lifting gas hydrogen and the passenger and crew areas. 
The living areas were located at the bottom, but the core of the airship was formed by the axial walkway. Surrounded by the sealed gas cells, the walkway ran the entire length of the ship. Underneath the cells along the bottom was the main walkway. Almost 800 feet long, it was used by the crew as the principal route for getting from one end of the ship to the other. The walkway linked the control car hanging beneath the front of the Zeppelin to the passenger decks located in the middle. The passenger decks were built within the body of the ship at the bottom of the hull and held the lounge where passengers gathered to gaze out the large viewing windows. These decks also contained the dining room and cabins. Further back, above the freight and mechanical areas, towered the 16 enormous gas cells containing 7 million cubic feet of hydrogen. Hydrogen is highly flammable when mixed with air. But with its years of experience, the Zeppelin company was confident the gas could be controlled. Elaborate safety features were designed to minimize the risk of fire and to prevent any accidental hydrogen leaks. The Germans felt perfectly safe with their hydrogen. It was definitely considered safe uh, by all the crew members um, because they had never had any reason to fear it. It was a it was an evil uh, um, that was in Pandora's box that they knew how to control. In the smoking room, for example, the room was always under pressure to keep air going out of the room instead of hydrogen in any way, shape, or form coming into the room. There were any number of safety precautions which they had taken. The ship's captain controlled the hydrogen through a sophisticated system of wires and pulleys attached to valves on the sides of the cells. These allowed him to release hydrogen in order to decrease the ship's altitude. The vented gas would automatically flow upwards through a sealed shaft to a series of vents on the ship's upper cover. To minimize the risk of a hydrogen fire, the system also ensured that any leaking hydrogen would make its way up to the vents and then safely dissipate into the atmosphere. Everybody was fully aware at the time that if there were to be a fire on board the airship, that this would mean more or less the end for all of us. By 1937, the Hindenburg had already logged 10 successful round trips from Germany to her American destination, the Naval Air Station at Lakehurst, New Jersey. Docking had become all but routine. Although large landing crews were required to maneuver the unwieldy ship to her resting place on the mooring mast. In the air, she was as graceful as a cloud. But once she dropped closer to the earth, she was somewhat more cumbersome. For her first flight of the 1937 season, she was carrying 97 people, 36 passengers and 61 crew. Delayed by persistent headwinds during the transatlantic crossing, she was hours behind schedule when she arrived over Lakehurst. That particular day, the 6th of May in 1937, it was raining, very bad rain, electrical storm. And uh, the ship was due in, and uh, the word got out that on the radio, we didn't have television, the radio stated that uh, it had to delay its flight into Lakehurst until it got cleared up. I was a part of the military ground crew. I mean, uh, and if it was delayed, I mean, we'd have to have to stay here and wait till we got here. I mean, it was 12 hours late. When the word came through that everything was clear and that they were going to land the ship, my husband asked me if we would go to see it. I see the Hindenburg. I said yes. So we grabbed my son, who was not quite four, and we went in. I was keeping watch in the forward engine car on the side of the airship when we flew in over the field to check the ground crew had everything ready for the landing. And fuhr eben zur Landung an. How do you do, everyone? We're greeting you now from the Naval Air Base at Lakehurst, New Jersey, from which point we're going to bring you a description of the landing of the mammoth airship Hindenburg. 
But here it comes, ladies and gentlemen, and what a great sight it is. A thrilling one. It's a marvelous sight. Coming down out of the sky, pointed directly towards us and towards the mooring mass. The ship is riding the gun. It was fabulous. It was the most beautiful sight you would ever want to see. The people in it and everything were so happy coming in that that particular day because I had seen it come in every time, but not as close as I was this day. It's practically standing still now to drop ropes out of the nose of the ship. It's been taken a hold up down on the field by a number of men. I could see the landing ropes being fastened on a winch below when suddenly there was a massive jolt through the ship and I thought, oh God, something's happened. My first thought was that the landing crew had pulled too hard and something had broken, but that wasn't it. When I looked out, I saw flames shooting forward from the rear of the Hindenburg toward my engine car. It's right and it's right. It's right and terrible. Oh, my, get out of the way, please. It's running for Everything went so quickly. The way the ship seemed to rise in the air. I planned to hold on to the frame until the ship hit the ground and then jumped. All I remember is feeling a shock in my hands and then I fell. I remember my heavy engine car crashing to the ground and then I passed out for perhaps a few seconds. Everybody, everybody kept running away from it and then afterwards running back towards to see what they could do, trying to help everybody out and pulling this and pulling that. That's about, and then the, the sirens were blowing and the ambulances. The fire went so fast through there that by the time it got to the nose, I mean, it came out of there like a blowtorch. The smell, the smell of the hydrogen, the blood, the, the rubber was terrible. And of course, there must have been human flesh in that because you could smell it. And it's like I always said, you never forget it. You would never forget the smell. It took less than one minute for the fire to completely consume the Hindenburg. The disaster claimed the lives of 36 people, 13 passengers and 22 crew members aboard the ship, and one civilian crew member on the ground. I thought my end had come, but suddenly there was the ground. Luckily it was sandy and soft, and I had more or less fallen on my feet. Immediately, I picked myself up and ran away. As we got closer to the ship, there was a man still in there. And he walked out of the ship after the nose was on the ground. And he didn't have a stitch of clothes on him. Everything was burned on him. From, and the only thing he had on him was his shoes. Everything, skin, hair, everything was burned. And he, didn't, he died right there. It was like a fire of hell. Everybody, oh God, oh God, that's all they were can saying. Because you couldn't help it. That's, and there was nothing you could do. All I could do was just look and cry. A fleet of ambulances ferried the injured to nearby hospitals, while firefighters worked through the night to douse the flames. The shocked township of Lakehurst, New Jersey, struggled to come to terms with the scale of the tragedy. Twisted, tangled mass of seared girders and bits of blackened fabric are all that remain to the proud luxury airliner Hindenburg that lies at the Lakehurst Naval Station. The death list is now 35, with 10, including Captain Cruz, still on the critical list. In Manhattan, an extraordinary memorial service was held for the Hindenburg's German victims. 
They were paid full Nazi honors as they lay in state, ready for their final voyage home to Germany. Quickly, attention turned to what could have gone wrong. There were numerous theories as to what caused the crash. Um, a turkey farmer taking a pot shot at the, there was, I mean, every conceivable uh, theory that you could imagine. The problem being proof, what really happened. Um, it is simply very, very difficult to discern when the airship is lost, basically. At Lakehurst, investigators began poring over the wreckage to look for clues. One probe was led by American officials, while Dr. Eckner and his senior colleagues from the Zeppelin Company supervised their own parallel inquiry. In the face of intense media speculation regarding the cause of the crash, Dr. Eckner remained tight-lipped. As long as investigation is pending, it is impossibly impossible for me to give you any statement or any ideas regarding the causes of the disaster. The very first suspicion was of sabotage. By 1937, the world was waking up to the evils of the Nazi regime. So the motivation for destroying such a powerful Nazi symbol was obvious. The Hindenburg was a vulnerable target for an act of sabotage. It would not have taken a very big explosive device to destroy that airship. The FBI was called in to investigate and immediately began background checks on the passengers and crew. Everyone had been subjected to a thorough search prior to embarking, so the investigators were looking for someone determined enough to smuggle an explosive on board. Attention quickly focused on a passenger named Joseph Spa, who had survived the crash. Spa was an odd character. A German acrobat, he lived in America, which put him under suspicion as a possible spy. He was also thought to be supple and strong enough to climb into the ship's structure to plant a device. Spa was also found to have had with him a camera and a flash that could have easily been rigged to start a blaze. But the theory did not pan out. No hard evidence against Spa could be found. And the FBI eventually reported that the sabotage theory was a red herring. With sabotage ruled out, the investigators turned to the only other explanation they could think of, mechanical failure. In the days before black boxes and flight recorders, they had to glean all their clues from eyewitnesses. Despite 55 prior safe flights, the search was on for a design defect in the Hindenburg that could have caused the disaster. The obvious weak point in the design was the use of the highly flammable lifting gas hydrogen, and the investigation shifted to ways leaking hydrogen could have triggered the fire. The Hindenburg's arrival at Lakehurst that May 6th had already been delayed due to bad weather, and when she came into land, there were still storms in the area. As the ship flew in for her final approach, just after 7 o'clock, hydrogen was vented from the control car to bring her back to Earth. She began her final tight turn angling into the wind in front of the mooring mast. The final maneuver was the release of the landing lines. Only minutes later, the spectators and ground crew saw the first signs of fire at the top of the ship just in front of the fin. Based on the testimonies of the 97 eyewitnesses, the investigators were confident that they knew where the fire had started. All they needed now was to explain why. Immediately, suspicion focused on the highly flammable hydrogen gas. The investigators at the time unequivocally just assumed that uh, since hydrogen was used as a buoyant gas, that somehow it got loose because it was flammable. Okay, where's the hydrogen coming from? It's got to come from gas cell. Well, was it a natural thing? Uh, was a valve stuck or something like that? They kind of ruled that out. So the next, uh, what appeared to be logical, was that, that a gas cell was breached by some technique. In other words, it was uh, torn or something like that. But the hydrogen breach hypothesis was little more than speculation. Using the investigative tools available at the time, the inquiry found no evidence to back the idea that a cell had leaked. 
Nevertheless, since no other explanation was available, the investigators put forth what seemed like an entirely logical theory, with hydrogen at its center. They concluded that hydrogen had leaked, combined with air to form a lethal mix, and was then ignited by a spark from a buildup of static electricity. Hydrogen was the, the, the weak point in the concept, if you will. It was flammable, very flammable when mixed with air. Um, and it ignited, uh, simple as that. The 63-page Department of Commerce accident report concluded, the cause of the accident was the ignition of a mixture of free hydrogen and air. Based upon the evidence, a leak caused a combustible mixture of hydrogen and air to form in the upper stern part of the ship in considerable quantity. The first appearance of an open flame was on top of the ship and a relatively short distance forward of the upper vertical fin. Today, vast hangar one at Lakehurst lies empty. Because of the official verdict blaming hydrogen, the great Zeppelin passenger airships never flew again, and hydrogen was permanently tarnished as an unsafe explosive gas. After the Hindenburg, I would say there was a decline in all airships in Lakehurst. And uh, no matter how we fought, we just couldn't get them back in. The decline was very bad after the Hindenburg. Nobody would operate with hydrogen, that was the thing. And uh, Dr. Ector in Germany forbid any more passenger flights with hydrogen. Hydrogen is a no-no. As the rusty doors of the hangar at Lakehurst roll grudgingly back 60 years later, the Hindenburg dossier is once again being opened. For the first time since the accident, the unchallenged assumptions about the role of hydrogen are being questioned and subjected to modern forensic techniques. The course of the investigation just assumed free hydrogen and then they backed up to try to find an excuse for the free hydrogen. That's pretty bad science. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, and liftoff of the space shuttle Endeavour to develop the practical and the beneficial aspects of space. The Kennedy Space Center in Florida is the hub of NASA's launch operations. And it is here that retired engineer Addison Bain has spent his career working with hydrogen, used in rocket fuel because of its extreme flammability. It was Bain's NASA experience with hydrogen that first sparked his interest in the Hindenburg mystery. I was on a one-year assignment in Washington, D.C. at the NASA headquarters, which is right across the street from the National Air and Space Museum. So I used to go over there and uh, visit quite often, particularly going over and having lunch. But there's a model of the Hindenburg in there, 25-foot-long model used in the 1975 Universal Studios movie. There's a plaque on the wall, and it says, essentially, the hydrogen exploded. Well, that bothered me a little bit. As a specialist who passionately believed in hydrogen's potential as a clean fuel of the future, Bain wondered whether the gas had unfairly taken the blame for the Hindenburg catastrophe. He began to investigate has now spent nine years methodically re-examining the official account of what happened at Lakehurst that day. The investigators at the time unequivocally just assumed that uh, since hydrogen was used as a buoyant gas, that somehow it got loose because it was flammable. As you read through the reports uh, and you look at how it was built up, there was no physical evidence building to the conclusion. Uh, there was no testing done to also support that, that evidence. So that made it, the story more suspicious. Bain's first step was to test the feasibility of some of the original inquiry's assumptions. In the workshop of hydrogen specialist Frank Lynch, he built a scale model of the ship's tail section, where the report had concluded the fire began. The model allowed him to probe the hydrogen theory by observing precisely what would happen if a hydrogen cell had gripped and developed a leak. What I've done, Frank, <clears throat> on the model is to uh, run a piece of tubing up and through and to the outside of cell four here to represent a leak in cell four, estimating probably a gash of maybe 
about uh, almost a meter wide. Yeah, 80, 80, 80 to one, that's a huge yeah. hole. Huh? Oh yeah, you bet. And then I would, I would suspect then the hydrogen gas will come on up and go out the vent here or out the vent in the tail there. The flow of hydrogen through the model simulates the flow rate from a good sized leak in one of the huge gas cells of the Hindenburg. A hydrogen detector is used then to see which way the gas flows. Let's try a uh, forward vent here. Ooh, it's coming out of there already. Okay, we got stuff coming out of there. <laughs> Let's try back here to vent back here, see if we got anything coming. Yeah, yeah. The model suggested that any leaking hydrogen would have quickly flowed upwards towards the vents, exactly as the designers had intended. And near the vents is exactly where the eyewitnesses had seen the fire begin. And the logic behind the hydrogen theory uh, appeared to be impeccable. What the model shows is if you had a hydrogen leak in a gas cell, where is the hydrogen going to go? And basically out up to the uh, vent stack. And that's where we just suspect the logical fire to start, but it didn't. Bain had made a startling discovery. Reviewing the eyewitness statements, he realized that the official report contained a glaring omission. The investigators had completely disregarded the testimonies of two key observers who saw something others had not. Their perspective was crucial because they had a view of this, the starboard side of the ship. Most of the witnesses were on the port side up near the nose or the bow of the airship. There were, then there were witnesses on the port side some distance away. There were very few witnesses who observed anything on the starboard side. In testimony, there are two people who discuss events occurring right along in here first before the fire spread. The first burning out of the fire was on the starboard side, above and up. I saw a small flame immediately in the back of the top fin, in the back of the fin, in the back of the whole surface and the rudders. A roar and a burst of flame near the big tail fin turned the ship into a flaming inferno. The hydrogen theory only made sense if the fire had started at the vent. Bain's discovery that it had begun elsewhere was the first indication that the initial conclusion was flawed. But to his expert eye, there was an even more glaring contradiction. Well, I've played around with hydrogen and created fires myself with hydrogen. Uh, some by accident and some from purpose, but uh, the, in the case of the Hindenburg, the, the action there simply just was not familiar with my experience with handling hydrogen. Something else was uh, taking place there. Though hydrogen is chemically unstable and highly flammable, hydrogen fires are very difficult to see with the naked eye, radiating a cold blue flame. Because it is lighter than air, hydrogen also tends to burn upwards very quickly. Yet the eyewitnesses were remarkably consistent when describing the colors of the fire. It was like a fire of hell. It was so intense and so red, very red, with the orange flames in it. I could see the whole airship from the nose to the tail, from where I was standing. And I saw that big red-orange glow, and it came out through the cover. Those descriptions of the colors of the fire were important clues. But Bain had only black and white photos to work with. By carefully sifting through all the descriptions, he created a color image of what witnesses said the fire actually looked like. This is a uh, consensus accumulation of eyewitness accounts as they described it. And I sort of just built a spectrum of what they talked about, and then we colorized this on the computer to show that. Typically, yellow, orange, reddish type flame was observed. And, of course, as we all know, hydrogen is basically invisible in daylight. Well, that's fine. I realized that at some point in time, hydrogen was part of the fire. There's no question about that. But it's being masked by this uh, intense uh, flame. The colorized photograph showed that the cause of the Hindenburg accident was far more complex than the straight hydrogen fire assumed by the official report. And the photograph had further significance. It showed that the airship remained buoyant many seconds after the fire began. 
the airship is um, still in trim, which means that a significant amount of hydrogen is still in these cells back here. If there had been a, a lot of uh, hydrogen lost back here in the stern area, it should have started descending immediately. The fact that the Hindenburg didn't immediately plummet when the fire started was further evidence of a flaw in the hydrogen theory. And Bain noticed another inconsistency when reviewing film footage. Thirty-six persons died in the flaming wreckage of the proud airship. To this day, the exact cause of the explosion remains a mystery. Though static electricity... The fire was so rapid and it actually engulfed the airship. And that's not characteristic of a straight hydrogen fire which would burn, you know, upward. Now, there was a slight wind that you could probably say that it would angle off to one side, but uh, nevertheless, just the whole action of the fire, it was almost like being in a forest fire where you had the fuel all around you. From her ashes will arise the knowledge. From her fate, the legend. Okay, sure, the airship was burning. Was it uh, being fueled by the hydrogen, or was it being fueled by something else? of the fire and its distinctive orange color were clues that the Hindenburg contained something flammable besides hydrogen. Around the aluminum frame, the airship was built of wood, cotton fiber, and other combustible materials that could have given the fire its orange appearance. But what most intrigued Bain was the incredible speed with which the ship's outer cover had burned. He calculated that the flame front along the outside had advanced as fast as 49 feet per second. The fire went so fast through there, it came out of there like a blowtorch. Within five seconds, the whole top was gone. It was so fast. It only took 34 seconds to burn. I mean, it just blew right out of there. Hindenburg's outer cover was a key feature of Zeppelin's technology. Designed to give the ship an aerodynamic profile, it also had to be waterproof and heat reflective to prevent the hydrogen from expanding. Zeppelin's engineers achieved this result by painting the cover with a doping compound containing a cocktail of chemicals. Were the chemicals to blame for the fire? Searching through the archives, Bain found hints that a new doping compound had been used on the Hindenburg, but he struggled to find details of the change. Well, it was a mystery in itself. I had gone through five different archives, thousands of pages of information. I accumulated uh, libraries from other people, experts on airships, collectors, purchased many, many books on airships, and read through them. and frankly could not find specifically what was used to coat the Hindenburg. Despite the lack of information about the doping compound, Bain felt sure there was a fatal flaw in the official explanation blaming hydrogen for the crash. He believed the truth lay in the airship's outer cover, but he needed hard evidence to prove it. The breakthrough came when I was attending a hydrogen conference in Cocoa Beach. And I saw this gentleman walking around with an airship book under his arm and I walked over to him, I says, uh, may I see that airship book? And he introduced himself as Richard Van Truen. He says he was looking for Addison Bain to talk about hotties, and I said, well, I'm here. <laughs> Richard Van Truen is a dirigible enthusiast with a multitude of contacts in the airship community. He was fascinated to learn about Bain's new theory. Well, up until the point of our meeting, Dr. Bain had not been able to find specific information about the Zeppelin's outer covering nothing has been published about it. So I was able to introduce him to a Mr. Hepburn Walker, a World War II airshipman, who had saved actual samples of the Hindenburg fabric from where she fell. Well, I try to get samples of any airship, that's, particularly rigid airships. I got samples of the girders of the Los Angeles, the ZMC-2 metal clad airship. The Hindenburg, of course, is the most famous airship in history. And I figured, well, I'd want a few samples of the girder work and the fabric work in it. And went out there and scuffed my foot and dug up pieces of fabric and so on. Remarkably, fragments of the outer cover had survived the blaze and were strewn across the landing site at Lighthurst. Oh, when I found that there were some fabric samples that were remnants of the Hindenburg, I was, a, uh, I was ecstatic. <laughs> I said, I know how to go find out what's in, the, in those materials, you know. 
the existence of genuine Hindenburg samples proved to be a key breakthrough. It meant that for the first time, Bain could study the chemical makeup of the outer cover and see why it had burned so quickly. Examining the fabric under an electron microscope and then using infrared spectroscopy, he was able to determine the precise mix of chemicals used in the doping compound. And this is the band we were looking for. That, that's the important yes. part right there. What was that showing there? Uh, you either need to know... He found that the doping mixture contained iron oxide and powdered aluminum. Being associated with space shuttle uh, activity, I knew that powdered aluminum was the fuel used on the, on the boosters. And I thought, boy, what a bad combination. The external boosters on the space shuttle are powered by a solid rocket propellant containing both aluminum powder and iron oxide. Bain's experiments had confirmed that those same chemicals were present in even greater proportions in the doping compound used to protect the Hindenburg's outer cover. The Hindenburg had been painted in the ingredients for rocket fuel. To prove that the flammable chemical cocktail had allowed the cover to burn so quickly, Bain still had to fit one final piece into the puzzle. He needed to determine how the fire had started. He turned to the Air Force Research Laboratories in Ohio, the United States' leading center for the study of the physical forces that affect aircraft. One key team at the center specializes in the dangers associated with sparks caused by electrostatic charges in the atmosphere. Okay, we've got 45 core. Go ahead and bring the voltage up. As an aircraft flies through the atmosphere, it actually can build up a static charge on the surface of the aircraft from what we call P-static or precipitation static, and that's just flowing through the atmosphere. Precipitation static can build up on any aircraft, including an airship. More importantly, the Hindenburg's landing at Lakehurst that fateful day had been delayed by bad weather. So the pilot was trying to squeeze the landing in between two large electrical storm fronts. There were thunderstorms in the vicinity, which meant that uh, the atmosphere probably was increasingly charged. This could be a factor in putting a substantial charge on the surface of the Hindenburg, more so than on a regular day. Yet, this had all been anticipated by Zeppelin's engineers. The internal frame of the airship was designed to be electrically bonded so that any charge it carried would flow harmlessly to Earth without a spark the moment the landing lines touched the ground. You have to have electrically a good conductive path. So if you get charging on an aircraft or if an aircraft gets struck by lightning, that the high currents or the high voltage buildup will have a good electrical low resistive path to flow on and off the aircraft. While investigating the ship's design, Bain discovered that the Hindenburg would not have been properly bonded. The outer cover was made up of individual panels of dope cloth attached to the airship's main frame by light cords. These cords were poor conductors and would have made it difficult for any charge carried on the panels to run to earth. Because of the high humidity and rain that day, some cords would have been more conductive than others, better bonding their panels to the rest of the airship. Any electricity on the bonded panels would safely have run off the ship when the landing lines were released. But some panels would have remained electrically isolated, retaining a huge voltage that would seek the easiest possible route to Earth. Eventually, the voltage difference between those panels and the grounded frame would be so great that a spark could leap across the gap, allowing the electricity to discharge. Clearly visible under an electron microscope, the aluminum particles in the doping compound would be a good conductor for that discharging electricity. Electrostatic charge has an affinity or an attraction to powdered aluminum. So once that reaction starts, then the aluminum gets extremely hot, of course, and it's in, in a very flammable environment, namely the, the cloth and the, the dope that's used on the cover. 
What's important there is the combination of those ingredients can be almost explosive. That electrical current discharging through the cover would also generate heat, enough to set the highly flammable aluminum alight, triggering the ensuing blaze. The Zeppelin engineers would not have realized they were playing with fire. They picked the aluminum powder because of its reflective properties, but at that time would not have known about its extreme flammability. With his last question answered, Bain is now ready to present his theory about what really happened to the Hindenburg. The landing that day had been postponed by bad weather. When the Hindenburg finally arrived at Lakehurst shortly after 7 o'clock, the rain had just stopped and there were still thunderstorms in the area, meaning that the atmosphere was more charged than usual. The captain prepared to make his final turn into the landing mast, gently slowing the airship down while venting hydrogen from the gas cells. As the ship approached the mast and the landing lines were dropped, most of the electricity on the ship discharged to Earth. But crucially, some of the outer cover panels were insulated from the main frame and retained their electrical charge, the trigger for the fatal sequence of events that followed. I believe the sequence of events first started back here near cell one and two, where there was an electrostatic discharge occurring across the fabric to the frame. That essentially ignited a highly flammable outer covering material, which then burned quite rapidly. But that intense heat from that fire then expanded the gas back here in cell one to a point where it over, uh, actually exploded back here and caused a forward jerk into the airship. The hydrogen then from that cell obviously came out and started burning above the airship. But in the meantime, very rapidly, this all is occurring, the fire moved very rapidly forward up over cell four, which was observed on this side, and then rapidly would come across and then, then forward. It was only at this point that the film cameras began rolling. Newly colorized footage shows the true appearance of the fire. As the flame front advanced down the ship, bursting the gas cells below, hydrogen began to fuel the blaze, its blue color masked by the bright orange of other burning materials. Bain is confident his is the true explanation for the Hindenburg disaster. But his theory is controversial, upsetting 60 years of perceived wisdom about the role of hydrogen. You can't tell me that the hydrogen wasn't burning in that thing, because that, oh, that, oh, that, well, once the uh, rear cells went, the uh, hydrogen started contributing to the fire. There's no uh, question I mean, about I mean but, but, the, but the glow was in there before the fire, the fire broke through the fabric. I saw this big red glow in that cell. Yeah, from, from your position, yeah. that's what you were seeing. I saw that red, big red glow sure in there. Did. But that's yeah. not hydrogen going, John. <laughs> well, something is burning. Sure, you bet it is. <laughs> and, but it wasn't the fabric. And I could see from where I was standing the whole top of it. I think that's, that's what you saw was right. But what you didn't see was a few seconds ahead of that. Well, I mean, the I, skepticism I would continue as long as Bain's account remained just a theory. To prove it conclusively, he decided to conduct one more vital experiment. He would need to sacrifice a valuable original piece of the Hindenburg's outer cover and subject it to the kind of extreme voltages seen that night. Unlike ordinary fabric, would the Hindenburg's doped cover catch fire as he predicted? This came from the top part of the airship. I know that because of the iron oxide coating and you can see where it was burned around the edges. There's two rip marks here where obviously it uh, came off the, the cover and fell to the ground and probably self-extinguished with the water on the wet ground that day. What I'm going to do is cut a small sample off of here and put it in an electrical machine. And then we're going to turn it on and see if it ignites. Recall now, this sample is over 60 years old. The collector's clubs around the world are going to kill me for doing this. Destroying an artifact. Combustion is virtually instantaneous. The Hindenburg disaster 
would have happened whether or not the ship was filled with hydrogen. As with the Titanic and Space Shuttle Challenger disasters, a vital but overlooked technological flaw had proved fatal. Although 60 years old, the sample still shows all the signs of high flammability. Work. <laughs> but there was one last twist to come. Deep in the archives of the Zeppelin Museum in Germany, the Hindenburg had one final secret to reveal. One of the crowning experiences in my investigation was the opportunity to go to Germany and visit the Zeppelin Museum and go through their archives. And frankly, by accident, I came across some very interesting information that's been there for a long time. Within the museum's archives lay the unpublished records from the German inquiry into the disaster. Scientists working for the Zeppelin company had secretly conducted their own experiments on the Hindenburg's outer cover. The conclusion they had reached was remarkable. With the right conditions, the cover would catch fire, whether or not the airship was filled with a flammable gas like hydrogen. Dr. Max Diekmann was a member of that scientific team. When my husband got back from Lakehurst, he went straight to his lab to carry out tests on models. Firstly, on the cover of the earlier Graf Zeppelin, then with the Hindenburg. Both were made wet as they would have been on the night, and then they were grounded. Nothing happened to the Graf Zeppelin cover, but the Hindenburg cover immediately caught fire. It's ironic that the tests that were done two months afterward are the same tests that I have run 60 years later. From what I can tell, that specific finding was never made public. And I've learned that that's probably for insurance reasons, uh, the politics at the time. Uh, obviously, the Third Reich didn't want to be embarrassed because of some bad engineering. I really think it was nothing but a cover-up. Zeppelin quietly made a number of design alterations to the Hindenburg successor, the LZ-130. Bronze was added to the doping compound to make it less flammable and the electrical bonding was improved to reduce the risk of sparks. The changes came too late. At the outbreak of war, the Nazis destroyed all the remaining Zeppelins. With the advent of fast, reliable airplanes, the fate of the airship was sealed. The Zeppelin company never revealed the truth about the disaster. The view of hydrogen as a dangerous and explosive gas became the accepted one much to the frustration of specialists like Addison Bain, who see it as the fuel of the future. Even when I was involved in writing safety manuals on hydrogen for NASA, invariably the, the, the topic of the Hindenburg came up, you know, and it, it left a very bad stigma, you know, in, in the, you know, the public perception is, is uh, that hydrogen is very dangerous because of that incident. But I think now that the uh, real story has come out, uh, maybe it will mitigate uh, and dispel that myth. Once we realize that the Hindenburg fire was not a hydrogen fire, we can once again look at buoyant flight and its associated efficiency, its environmental friendliness, and the other traditional advantages that we've missed for these past 60 years we can bring airships back to the mainstay and have them fill the role that they are good at. While it is unlikely that airships will once again rule the skies, Bain's work seems to have finally laid to rest the mystery of what happened to the Hindenburg. They were viewed as a model society, but did they hide a dark secret? People have a big problem 
watching our evidence say that someone was being eaten. Uncover the controversy of an ancient society. Cannibalism in the canyon. A secret of the dead continues in a moment. Secrets of the Dead was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Secrets of the Dead is available as a four-volume home video set for $59.98. Individual episodes are available for $19.98. To order, call 1-800-336-1917 or write to the address on your screen. You're watching PBS. Tonight on Houston Public Television, On the Waterways travels the Florida Peninsula from the Panhandle to the Everglades, followed by Nature and the Living Edens. Then Masterpiece Theater presents the conclusion of Monsignor Renard, followed by an EastEnders double feature. Next time on ExxonMobil Masterpiece Theater. You're sentenced to death. I won't allow it. You won't allow it. A French priest. Evil is a very real presence. But it can be beaten. Monsignor Renard. Don't miss the conclusion tonight at 9. Hello, I'm Jonathan Pond. I help people decide how to make the most of their money. Not only by showing them ways to increase the value of money through prudent investing, but also by counseling them on how money can promote the personal values that each of us holds dear. And when someone asks me for a good way to use money for a valuable cause, I simply say, help your public television station. It's a perfect match for your money if you value the best things in life, like culture, entertainment, education, knowledge, the environment, and better human relations. There are many ways for you to provide a legacy of values to your public television station through gifts, your will, a trust, or a life insurance policy. And your PBS station will be happy to help you decide. For more information, contact Carol Bornstein at 713-749-8308. He put a camera in everyone's hands and changed the way we see the world. A fatherless boy, a high school dropout. He overcame embarrassing failures and his own insecurities to build a global photographic empire. George Eastman, the Wizard of Photography, on The American Experience. Monday night at 8 on Houston Public Television. Battlefield 2. The Battle for the Rhine saw some of the most audacious and dramatic gambles of the whole war. The Rhine River, a major obstacle to the Allied conquest of Nazi Germany and the liberation of occupied countries. What no one had expected was that it would turn into a major battle and one of the bloodiest yet fought by American troops. The Battle for the Rhine, next time on Battlefield 2. The battle rages on Thursday night at 7. From the campus of the University of Houston, this is Channel 8, KUHT Houston, a service of the University of Houston and supported through the Association for Community Television.